Myrtle Fillmore would be proud. <laughs> Good morning. So we are in our beginnings, laying the foundation of this year's theme, which is about spiritual community. And as Aaron and the band and everyone sang, my vision for Seattle Unity is it become a place where everybody knows your name and they're always glad you came. So I challenge you to reach out and introduce yourself every week to somebody you don't know, to learn a name. I know sometimes we see each other's faces and we're like, well, I don't want to let you know I don't know your name. So we could make it easy and say, hi, my name is, and my name is, and it's, it's just kind of, it's the year of being seen. And yes, we will make room for introverts as well so that you can be quiet in all that and, and still, but we're uh, experimenting with um, having a closing circle instead of, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's too bad we couldn't just pick up the pews and make them all round, you know, so that we could be more circular, but this was built in the, in the 50s, so this is what we have, and it's wonderful. Bless it. <laughs> so uh, what Jesus said, whenever two or more are gathered in my name, there am I in the midst. And what he meant by that is when two come together in prayer, when two come together envisioning something, then a third appears. In unity, we call it the Christ, but it is, it is a, a third presence, if you will. It is spirit. It is magic. It is that thing that allows us to uh, manifest together. And we do it as couples, we do it in families, we do it in communities, we do it in countries, we do it in small groups and in large groups. Um, and it, in, here at Seattle Unity, in our spiritual community, I believe that what we practice together is spiritual principles. And that means we believe there is one presence and one power in the universe, God the good, omnipotence, omnipresence, and omniscience. And so what that means is, is that we are willing to see the good in our own lives, in each other, and in every event that happens to us and all around us. I loved what Jan Phillips said last week, our guest speaker. She said that our job here, or our purpose, our function here as human beings is to take darkness and transmute it into light. That dark things happen to us. It's, it's what is. And it is our choice as human beings. I mean, granted, we have to grieve it, we have to feel it, we have to go through it. But it is our choice as human beings to stay with it and wallow it in it and increase it, or we can take it and transform it into light. And I love that. I just, I love that. And using our imaginations and our vision that that is our gift to the planet. It's one of the reasons we're here. And Seattle Unity, all spiritual communities, are a place where you can practice those principles together. Carl Jung referred to the group mind as the collective consciousness. Charles Fillmore called it race consciousness, and he believed that, that we agreed on this whole setup, you know, as we entered into our bodies. And he has this whole theory that as humans, we could have chosen not to age and die, but we could have chosen to be more of a spiritual nature. He says, but the body won out. Race consciousness determines how we live and what we do. And, and when enough of us awaken to a different way of being, then, you know, that's what he called the new Jerusalem or the second coming, if you will. So when we think about community, when we think about the collective consciousness, when we think about the group mind, I think for me, one of the things that comes up is, and probably one that we've all had experience with, is sporting events. Yeah? So today's Super Bowl Sunday, right? How many of you are going to a party after? It's Super Bowl Sunday. And we go to baseball games and hockey and basketball and whether it's, you know, our kids in high school or college or it's a, it's a major league team. What we're doing is we are, uh, we're, we're with thousands of people 
and we're getting to collectively join our energy together and watch some amazing things. And I don't think it's any accident that some magical things happen in sports. You know, we're all witness to some magical feats. And yes, it's because of the, the talent of the person. But I think it's also about the energy that we're directing and, and, and giving to our teams. I and mean, that's why they say that you have a home team advantage when you're playing at home. Why? Because the crowd is cheering for you. So you have that energy behind you. You have that consciousness behind you. We see the collective consciousness acting in uh, microcosm, in small ways, and in macrocosm. So a microcosm would be getting on an airplane going to a specific city. So, for instance, whenever I fly to Kansas City, I notice that everybody on the plane is kind of family-oriented, if not a whole family traveling together. Kansas City is the one airport that I go to where when you get off the plane, you'll see entire families waiting to greet somebody as they get off the plane. There's grandma and the granddaughter and everybody's there, the cousins. They're all like, hey, you're back. How nice to see you. Now, when I fly to Chicago, what I notice is people are really big, and they're really loud, and they're really funny. People are, you know, telling jokes a lot. Um, when I have flown to Reno, people are gam and it's mainly because it's tourists, but they're gambling on the plane, you know, they're playing cards and they're getting ready. And last year, I flew to Reno to visit. My daughter was playing soccer there, and as I was uh, getting on the plane to come home to Seattle, I noticed that everybody on the plane, you know, they had cell phones and they were texting and they were writing and they were really busy. And I thought, God, this plane seems so smart. Seems like such a smart plane. And then I thought, oh, this is Seattle. This is Seattle. Seattle's a very smart city. <laughs> in fact, Seattle has come in consistently in pretty much the top 10 of the smartest cities in the country. So <laughs> applaud yourself. <laughs> So when we come together collectively, uh, we create an energy field. And of course, that energy field is different depending on what we're doing. Um, in Unity Village, many years ago, I uh, was a wedding coordinator. And in the, uh, at the rehearsal, which was usually about 20 people or maybe 30 at the most, it was the wedding party in the family, what I noticed was that if the wedding rehearsal was easy, and everybody was just really easy to get along with. And the next day at the wedding, when there were 200 guests in attendance, it was going to be a pretty easy day. But if anybody or the wedding party was difficult, and there were problems, and there was drama, well, guess what? The drama was multiplied by that many guests the next day. And so again, we had the microcosm in the macrocosm because there's that consciousness that we, not only do we attract uh, people who are like us, but we bring them with us. Doesn't matter where we are, right? I mean, doesn't matter. So I could always predict what the wedding was going to be like the next day. John Lennon said that a dream that you dream alone is only a dream but a dream that you dream together is reality. And he found this in his relationship with Yoko. They discovered that if they worked together for things, if they envisioned things together, they were more likely to bring its manifestation into their lives. And, how, and again, it's that whenever two or more are gathered in my name, there am I in the midst, there is that mystical presence. And it's the same mystical presence that manifests itself in community. Now. I believe that we also can use this collective consciousness for, you know, we have a choice. We have free will. So we can use it for the positive or it can manifest in, in the negative. You know, whenever we're going to war, it seems like that collective consciousness is starts heading down the wrong track and it's like it starts moving before we can stop it. Um, on a lighter note, I have seen... Um, the, the, the experience of a collective consciousness at work at Wrigley Field in Chicago with the Cubs. True. So, in 2005, in 2005, the Cubs were playing the Marlins for the pennant. Now, they have not won a World Series since 1908. 
They have not won a pennant since 1945. And uh, in 2003, they were ahead in the series, three to two. It was the eighth inning. There was one out, and they were ahead three to nothing. They only needed five more outs to win the pennant. Do you hear me? Five more outs. I could smell it, I could taste it, I could feel it. I knew it. And then one of the Marlins got up to bat and he hit a foul ball to, to the outfield and one of the fans reached out and caught it, preventing the outfielder from catching it and getting an out. Now, did it affect the game? Absolutely not. It was a foul ball. It affected nothing. But in that moment, I knew it was over. I was at home watching the game with my family, and I said, it's over. That's it. It's over. It's done. And everybody's like, what is wrong with you? It's a foul ball. It means nothing. And I said, no, it's over. It's absolutely over, and I can't even watch the rest of it. And they thought I was crazy, and I knew it. Everybody at Wrigley Field knew it, and I think every Cub fan scattered across the country knew it in that moment. <laughs> the Cubs went on to lose that game 8-3, to three, and they lost the game the very next day. And so, of course, they didn't get in the pennant or the World Series next year, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> And I think, you know, Terry de Chardin said that there's a noosphere, there's a thought envelope. And I think there's a thought envelope around Wrigley Field that's like, it's not going to happen. I lived through it in 1969. We were in first place the entire year. And then we went to New York to play the Mets and a black cat walked in front of the dugout and everything fell apart in the last two weeks. <laughs> it did. <laughs> and when you look at the history, um, they say that it began in 1945 in the last World Series in which they played, in which uh, a man cursed the Cubs because they threw him out because he brought his goat to the ball game and they wouldn't let him stay. <laughs> his name was Billy. He owned the Billy Goat Tavern, and he, apparently this goat fell off a truck and wandered into his tavern with a sore leg, and so he adopted it. And so he brought it to the game. It had a sign on its... Uh, side that said they were playing Detroit. Uh, Detroit's going, going to the goats or something, you know. And so uh, he had a box seat ticket for this goat and sat with it. And <laughs> we got Detroit's goat. That's what, that's what the sign said. Anyway, so they're watching the game and it started to rain and the goat stank. So the, the, uh, the uh, fans started to complain. So they threw him out. And he said, you will never win another World Series. I curse you. Uh, he sends Phil Wrigley a telegram that says you're going to lose this World Series and you are never going to win a World Series again because you insulted my goat. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, they went on to lose. And, uh, you know, they've tried. They found the descendants of this man. And they... <laughs> And they brought a goat into Wrigley Field to walk around in 1984 and in 1989. <laughs> and the Cubs won the division that year, but not, not the pennant. Now, I share this story with you because it's funny, but it also speaks to, I think, something that happens there. And it happens over and over and over again. And what I find interesting is uh, new generations will come along and they don't know anything about the story. They don't know anything about anything and they witness the same thing happening. So it's as if there's this noosphere that exists within that place. So there's a noosphere that exists within Seattle Unity. There's a noosphere that exists within your family and within the, the city of Seattle and, and uh, in, in all places. And when we come together in a, in a collective energy, so maybe if everybody at Wrigley Field all of a sudden did a guided meditation or something and saw the Cubs winning, maybe that would work. I don't know, but... <laughs> the truth is the way we change things is by collectively coming together and either knowing it together or speaking the word. Now we see it happening all the time. Right now in Russia... 
120,000 people are protesting Putin. You think Putin is going to last? I don't think so. Not when 120,000 people show up. We've seen the, the movements in Egypt. We see the Occupy movement. We see uh, when people come together collectively in voice, things begin to change. Margaret Mead said, never uh, underestimate a power of a small group to change the world. In fact, that's the only way that anything ever does get changed, yeah? And this is Black History Month, so I wanted to touch on the March on Washington in 1963 because it was a combination of several civil rights organizations and it's an example of coming together collectively and making changes for a world that definitely needed to be changed back then. The demands, the demands of the march were the passage of meaningful civil rights legislation, the elimination of racial segregation in public schools, protection for demonstrators against police brutality, a major public works program to provide jobs. They made the minimum wage to be uh, $2. And so they came together as one voice. And we may recognize that experience from Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech, which was August 28, 1963. But there was another speech given that day by John Lewis, and I want to share with you some of the words that he said on that day. He said, the revolution is at hand, and we must free ourselves of the chains of political and economic slavery. The nonviolent revolution is saying, we will not wait for the courts to act, for we have been waiting hundreds of years. We will not wait for the president, nor the Justice Department, nor Congress, but we will take matters into our own hands and create a great source of power outside of any national structure that could and would assure us a victory. And did that not happen? They changed. Everything changed. They, maybe not in that moment, maybe not right at that second, but over the years we look at this and we go, oh yeah, I remember that. The things began to shift and change. So the collective consciousness, the race mind, if you will, the community, the noosphere, we come together and there's great power in that. So this is the year at Seattle Unity where my hope is that everyone will know your name. And they'll be so happy to see you. They'll be so happy that you're here and glad that you came. We are here on this planet. Our role as humans is to turn darkness into light. Yes, we will have dark experiences. It's part of being here on this planet. But our role is to transform those experiences into light. So whether you are in community with your family or you're experiencing community today as you watch the Super Bowl and focus on your team and send it some energy, whether it's in spiritual community, we come together in this energy field and we come together collectively to agree on certain premises that there is only one presence and one power in the universe and in my life. God, the good, omnipotence. We come together recognizing that the spirit of God is in every single being. We come together knowing that it's our thoughts and our emotions that help create our reality. And we join in that together. A dream is a dream. If you dream it alone, it's only a dream. But when we dream together, it becomes reality. So here's to the year of 2012 in dreaming in community. May all your dreams manifest. Thank you.